Good morning, world. I'm going to be listening to Anderson Horowitz's podcast uh, about making the information age. Well, I play Hearthstone because what other combination would you expect? Welcome to the A16Z podcast. Today we're doing one of our book episodes and we're talking about genius and the process of innovation through the life of Claude Shannon, the father of information theory. He was also an architect of the digital age who, among other things, worked with Vannevar Bush and befriended Alan Turing. This conversation is moderated by A16Z board partner Stephen Sanofsky with special guests Jimmy Sony and Rob Goodman, authors of a new biography of Shannon just out called A Mind at Play. Rob's voice is the first you'll hear right after Stephen's. I want to start off by just setting some context. Uh, back in, I think, around 1990, Scientific American said, decades after this paper was published in 1948, that Shannon created, quote, the Magna Carta of the Information Age. What did they even mean by that? That's a pretty big statement. Uh, Shannon's paper of Mathematical Theory of Communication is something like a founding document. It, it laid out the principles that make the digital transmission of information possible. And Shannon in this paper does things like introduce the concept of the bit, explain how you can quantify information, explain how you can use uh, digital codes to compress information and to send it with uh, arbitrarily perfect uh, accuracy. So all these things that are foundational to digital communications in the present, uh, Shannon lays them out. And that, that's a Magna Carta scale achievement. Let's kind of go back in time and go back to, uh, you know, his earliest years. And he was born in 1916, more than 100 years ago. He probably didn't have much in the way of electricity, of indoor plumbing, of all of those kind of things. It was very early in the, the 20th century and in industrialization in the Midwest. What was he born into? So he uh, was born in uh, Upper Michigan, and his childhood is the childhood of a sort of boy tinkerer, right? He plays with uh, broken radios and takes them apart and puts them back together. There was a line that uh, all the broken radios in Gaylord passed through Claude Shannon's hands. Uh, he builds a makeshift elevator in the back of a barn with a friend. So Gaylord is his hometown. Yeah. Like, how big is that town? Two or 3,000 people. Tiny. It was like a small village, but it had, it because it was close to railroads, uh, it had some... Uh, commercial importance to the region, but his dad is a probate judge, uh, mom is a teacher, and he is a boy who's constantly playing, building things, always trying to sort of figure out how to rig things up. So he rigs up a barbed wire telegraph between his house and a friend's house. So he uses the barbed wire as the transmission Yeah, wire. exactly. Claude is a boy. I mean, he's just doing this for fun. So that's sort of the rough equivalent of like hacking away at a Raspberry Pi today? Basically, <laughs> yes, basically. And then he's also, you know, he's like, he has inspiration from his family. His great, his grandfather was a uh, was an inventor. Uh, he actually had filed a patent to improve on the washing machine. Um, mm -hmm. And so he's inspired by that. And he's a distant cousin of Thomas Edison. So that's kind of in the family lore as well. But he has a very normal childhood. Uh, compared to other geniuses, I mean, we are not talking about somebody who whose parents are drilling him in, in the finer points of advanced mathematics at a young age. They allow him to play. They allow him to do do his, his, own, mm -hmm. his own life. But also compared to many of the other scientists that emerged in and that would also later become his his contemporaries he also didn't face like a, oppression yeah compared to all the people who made such a difference in technology in the 20th century claude shannon had just a, a pretty idyllic childhood and one of my favorite parts of researching this lucky book him reading some newspaper headlines from this tiny town of gaylord some of our favorites were meeting held to discuss artichokes <laughs> and Vern oh. Matz loses finger so those are the kind of things that made the uh, front page of the newspaper in Gaylord, Michigan. And that's the kind of childhood Shannon had. One of the things that fascinates me about whenever I get to read about the inventors from that that started in that era is just how how versatile they are. Like it's it's rather incredible that that you could become essentially as expert as you can become in so many different things his mom is a musician so he ends up playing the um the french horn uh, and later picks up the jazz clarinet uh he does reasonably well in school it turns out that uh part of the reason he decided to go whole hog on mathematics is because his sister was good at math and there was a little bit of sibling rivalry huh. he finds his way to the university of michigan and it, he comes at a really interesting time because the engineering school has just gone through this massive expansion and i find it relevant to what's going on today with the discussion about coding and the importance of sort of transforming education to the modern era, he seemed to be fortunate enough that the University of Michigan was busy transforming itself from sort of a, a normal, as you would, like liberal arts school 
into like, hey, we need to be an engineering school. There's this quote from, I think, the dean of engineering who's uh, almost excited because the engineering uh, department is about to pass the liberal arts department registration. And he says, by God, we'll pass them yet. So it's just this sort of idea that the, the economy is changing around the school. And uh, the school is really investing a lot in its 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 capital, both physical capital and human capital, to keep up with that. What what else happened to him at Michigan that was was such an interesting part of his country? Yeah. He started publishing answers to these mathematical puzzles uh, that came at the very back of academic oh. journals. By the way, we actually published the puzzles in the book. So for anybody who wants to try to solve what Claude Shannon was solving, you're welcome to try. Yeah, I'm good. Um, I'm good. Rob, <laughs> Rob and I couldn't. But imagine that you're a, high, a college junior or senior. You're like picking up these academic journals, flipping to the back, looking at these puzzles, working out long solutions, sending them in for publication. What it suggested to us was, this was a guy who wasn't going to go back and run the family furniture business. Um, he was actually going to try to make it as an academician and as somebody who was going to get some advanced training. And it's a pretty incredible thing when you think about a, a, a kid like Claude Shannon with not particular me no particular means from a reasonably modest family, a small town, going to the University of Michigan and managing to get two pieces published in these journals later later in his collegiate career. That's that's a pretty extraordinary thing when you think about where he is coming from. Yeah. I mean, especially because most of the people reading those and answering them were probably on the East Coast at Harvard and MIT. And then also in Michigan, he was either being pulled to the mechanical world of farming or to the soon to be created auto industry. Right. And he was someone who made a point of studying engineering and mathematics at the same time. And I think that was relatively rare to double major in those two things. Uh, Shannon said he just did it because uh, he was just a few courses away from getting a double major. So why not? So he finished up at Michigan and then like did this awesome thing where he's just like, hey, I think I'm going to go to MIT. So again, it, it kind of testifies a little bit to Shannon's ambition. He sees this uh, job application invitation um, on uh, something the size of a postcard that's posted up in the engineering building at Michigan. Uh, and it says, uh, come to MIT and uh, work as a graduate student uh, with uh, Beneva Bush and the Differential Analyzer, which is uh, one of the leading computing machines of the day. It's an analog computer. Uh, so Shannon sends off his application. Uh, so it, it testifies, one, to the fact that he had this you know, decent publication record for an undergrad, but also to the fact that uh, Beneva Bush, uh, who was one of the great sort of scientific networkers and organizers in 20th century America, he had a real eye for talent. He was the first person really well up in the scientific hierarchy to spot Claude Shannon's talent and to sort of invite him into the big leagues, in a sense. So Bush wrote this very famous article called As We May Think, right. which is sort of the history of the iPhone or a tablet or a whole bunch – or the and the web and a whole bunch of other stuff all rolled into a single paper, which itself is phenomenal. Right. But he does – so he ends up getting a job with, with Bush. I, I was fascinated – it, you know, by this description, because it, it goes back to being talented in many things like Bush had this whole philosophy of engineering that was deeply and he was running. He was like a dean at MIT. So he was in charge right. of a lot of stuff. And so he was he, he didn't believe in like the pure theory, but he also didn't believe in sort of the pure mechanical. He, he had this bizarre view of at the time of of like sort of how do you think with your hands? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he had a great example when he was constructing this differential analyzer. He said he was working with a, a pretty um, uh, not very well schooled uh, mechanic to actually build this thing. He said by the end of the process of putting this thing together, this mechanic didn't mean to destroy my guy. He didn't really get it on an intellectual level, but he knew it with his hands. He got it in his bones because uh, Bush <laughs> and the machines that he built were all about uh, analog processes, about acting out differential equations, about um, thinking about how to make things uh, through the act of building. You know, Bush said that he was never really more than a you know, yeah, second rate mathematical brain, but he was a great builder and a great organizer. And he was really someone who put those skills to use for uh, for doing math, uh, for acting out math. And and that was something that I think was uh, really key to what made him such an important figure in the field of computing. I don't know that there's a figure in science at that time who was better as a mentor for Claude Shannon than Vannevar Bush. I, just building on this, Bush was building essentially these analog purpose built machines <coughs> to solve problems. And it's really hard for us to wrap our heads around what was going on. But it was sort of like, if you want to tra track the trajectory of a missile, then you build like a bunch of metal that operates in a certain way and you spin wheels and the answer to the missile's trajectory pops out the other end. But if you wanted to then do some weather forecast, the machine was irrelevant. You'd have to completely rebuild it from scratch. Um, so it really wasn't the most practical machine, but these are room-sized computers, huge, they call them fearsome things of gears and shafts.
the problem solving that an analog computer was doing was actually mm -hmm. replicating what the problem looked like and then figuring out the solution. So it did have to be rebuilt. It broke constantly. Uh, it was really frustrating. People had to watch it 24 hours a day because it, the bad things would happen if you didn't. And, and like debugging it involed like, you know, filing more off of some part, right. like adding a tooth and a gear. Or kind of, and what, what I think is actually really neat in hindsight is Bush was was attempting to push his students, in, including Shannon, to build like the general purpose version of this machine that could like solve any differential equation. And if you kind of do an analogy today, that's a lot like like people saying, hey, let's go solve general AI when all the grad students are using machine learning to pick out kitten videos. <laughs> and so they understand how to use machine learning for kitten videos. But the idea of like, you know, figure out what videos to go find and look at and classify them and understand it just seems really far off. It gives much more optimism that general AI might be solved because if you were Vannevar Bush, you were just not getting closer to your general purpose differential engine until Shannon comes along. And, and the really interesting part about that is that when you set people onto these general problems, you can't necessarily predict where the solution is going to come from or what's going to be productive. Mm. So what Bush is interested in is configuring, like you said, a, a general purpose analog computer that can reassemble itself on the fly and can use electrical relays to um, change the quantities of the various variables that shafts and gears representing. And, and Shannon takes this in a very different direction uh, hmm. through his study. Of I would use it to pick out kitten videos. In the switching system when he realizes that this can really be combined with uh, Boolean logic. And this is something that, that Chris Dixon wrote in his great article about Shannon in the Atlantic where he said like um, that. that Shannon figured out how to uh, map logic, Boolean uh, logic, onto the I could put down another taunt. Because Bush sort of set him to uh, deal with this problem in general computing. And it turned out to be you know, hugely productive because Shannon, along with Turing's paper in the same year, uh, is really laying the foundations for all the digital computers that come afterwards. Well, it sounds like also that that was another example of, you oh, know, like a person who down. was skilled in many disciplines applying the different disciplines uh, 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 across them. I mean, he, he understood Boolean <coughs> logic, he understood math and calculus, and he was a tinker. What can I do? I'm just going to and sacrifice one of my guys. Well, so he understood the switches. He studies logic as an undergrad. He manages to work at the phone company. He gets Vannevar Bush as a mentor. Uh, and he works on the differential analyzer. There is a bit of this that you feel like is almost kismet, and these things, logic and the switches and the analyzer, had been in the ether. It took Claude Shannon to fuse them together. So he comes through up with this sort of breakthrough notion of you know bringing together, you know, logic gates, Boolean logic, circuits, and it, it seems as amazing as this was. It wasn't quite a leap to like the computer. It was recognized almost immediately as a really important piece of work. It, it won uh, the Nobel Prize, which is different than the Nobel Prize. We had to point that out in the book, which is an award <laughs> for engineering papers. So after he's done this amazing piece of work in the area of uh, switching and logic, Bush says to him, why don't you go write your dissertation on theoretical genetics now? <laughs> because why not, right. Mr. Claude Shannon? So Claude Shannon says, okay, and he goes off and does it. And it's possible that took him out of direct contact with that field, at least for a temporary amount of time. And then the war happens. Yeah, it's really interesting because at this point, Everyone is taken to focusing on the needs of the war, yeah, the war department, desk. and he's decided <coughs> on the and doesn't appear to be particularly religious or even dogmatic in anything other than his beliefs about math and engineering. Sorry, one other thing. He's very dogmatic about jazz music. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, aren't we all? How, how did that play in the environment he's in where, <laughs> you know, people had fled? From, from Europe because of the war. What was on his mind? He, did he care about the repercussions of technology or did he push aside the beliefs? It absolutely played a role. So th this is actually a very hard time in Claude Shannon's life. It's the cusp of the American entry into World War II. He himself admits he doesn't want to do the draft. He's a frail guy. He likes to keep his own you know, counsel. His first marriage is collapsing, and he has gone from MIT to Princeton's Institute of Advanced Studies, where he's on fellowship, and he doesn't quite know what's going to come next, and there's the very real risk that he gets drafted and sent overseas to fight. And what he has now, you know, over the course of his undergrad and his graduate studies, acquired some impressive mentors. Those mentors get him a wartime contract working at Bell Laboratories that spares him from the draft. More importantly, hey, Bell Labs. It puts him working on practical applications of mathematics and technology and not just practical we're talking the most practical oh my god is on fire control which 
basically is how do you shoot things down from the sky? Yeah, it's like an anti aircraft. It's like yeah. a control unit for for a really fast shooting oh, aircraft gun, sh- not <laughs> not like fire or flames. Right. But there's complicated mathematics that has to go into uh, figuring out how to do that and do it at scale, and <laughs> it leads him to connect with many of the the senior figures at Bell Laboratories who are so impressed by his work uh, that they are then able to pull him into the laboratories permanently. The war is a, I mean. It, it changes the lives of everyone in that generation. <coughs> Claude Shannon, it leads him from fire control to cryptography, which is an important development in his life. Um, but I, I do think that, in a way, without the war, I'm not sure that you get to the 1948 paper, to the, you get to the theory of communication, because he, he could well have... I had to uh, sacrifice my tiger. He was at Princeton, and it's, it's like, good grief, the guy's in his 20s, and he's hanging out with von Neumann, someone made of course, with... With like Einstein. we haven't filled our favorite AI Einstein to play. Claude Shannon is at uh, the IAS in Princeton. Uh, Against random people. Brother. And uh, halfway through the talk, uh, Einstein, yeah. Einstein sure. uh, walks into the room Starcraft. and he sits for a couple of seconds and he leans over and whispers well, something. Well, Harrison's next. And he walks out again. Yeah, they haven't and done Shannon immediately after the lecture's gone, like runs up to Tom and says, "Oh my God, that one sucks so fun. much." That'd be a ton of fun. Yeah. Definitely do hard stuff. <laughs> Or the tea and cookies, apparently. Or the tea and cookies. We've got two versions of the story. Oh, yay. Hit me with your 13. Crypto comes up. Oh, Oh, wait. He didn't. He couldn't. Fortuitously or by some higher power, uniquely qualified to go after cryptography. You know, the field was completely different when he started. Back to analog, differential machines, and stuff like that. In fact, like he worked on... One of the early real, real time systems, you know, Sig Sally, and that did not look like any computer that we ever would think of. What did you <clears> change cryptography? Now I die. So there's a, a number of things. I think it's worth also being fought a good fight. It, it's worth sort of level setting where he no, I didn't. In his life. Um, so he just finished his graduate studies. Uh, his first marriage has collapsed. Um, he, it was a, a really emotionally difficult event. He moves to the West Village it's, in New York, and he starts going to bed every do. day. Bell Labs has gone from, I think, 3,000 employees to 9,000 employees, and a lot of the employees in the office are wearing military uniforms. Uh, and so this is a, a really tense time. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there, basically, everybody is working a six- or seven-day work week just until, you know, until the war ends. And into this mix steps Claude Shannon with his knack for math, with his fa- boyhood fascination with codes, uh, and a, a kind of facility for code breaking and for code making. And that's what he does for, for a little while. He focuses on how the U.S. can better encrypt the messages that it's sending to the Brits, uh, and he focuses on kind of understanding the fundamentals of cryptography. <coughs> he writes a famous, a now famous paper that is classified for, for years. I believe it's called the Mathematical Theory of Cryptography, mm. and he proves the existence of a one-time pad, uh, the existence of an unbreakable code. One of the more oh. interesting elements of this work is that it puts him in touch with Alan Turing. In, in what is probably, honestly, my, my favorite chapter in the book, he and Alan Turing are having tea every day. Alan Turing's a little older than him at this point. Yeah, but Alan, so Alan Turing's on a billet from the, the British government to make sure that what the U.S. is doing uh, in terms of the messages it's sending is, is secure. Um, the Brits were very suspicious that the U.S. just wasn't going to get it right. And so Alan Turing's at Bell Labs and Claude Shannon's at Bell Labs, and these sort of two giants of computing meet and these are guys who don't make new friends easily, become friendly, and have tea every day. It's just mm-hmm. an incredible story. It's amazing to me that all of this Aww. is happening at, at what is effectively a corporate lab. Mm-hmm. And it is, it's, it's actually a testament to Bell Laboratories yeah. that, that somebody like Shannon is, A, uh, invited to be there in the first place because it's not like he has a specific job title. He joins the mathematical research group, and they basically go around cherry-picking the problems that they would like to solve, and they don't have to do anything they don't want to do. Um, well, they're the phone company. That's <laughs> so true. It helps to have a government monopoly, a government backed monopoly. Um, but the truth is that he has he has this extraordinary mentor and, and the head of that department in Thornton Fry, who realizes uh, that there are a bunch of academic mathematicians who don't want to stay in academia, and you don't really know what to do with them. Uh, and he he sort of says, well, if you invite them in and attach them to engineers, attach them to physicists. Mm-hmm. They, they can help. They can, they can sort of amplify and help solve problems. And so Claude Shannon is one of these sort of flexible problem solvers. So Bell brings people like him in. The second thing that Bell does, oh, it's like you could have card because you were fucking healed yourself. Today. They have blogs today. 
Bell is publishing a full academic journal yeah. for most of the 20th century. And these are, are rigorous papers distributed around the country. University researchers read them. And it really is a, a hallmark of that, that era that someone like Claude Shannon, who you know, by day is working on cryptography, on, on the coloration of wires for the, fo- for the phone service, is also in a place where he can write a 77-page paper that you know, develops an entire field from scratch. So now we're post-war, and we're back to Shannon going on to solve even bigger problems. And the no- notion of communication comes up, and it's, it's, at this point it was still rather primitive. I, I think like, the idea of like, wow, the signal doesn't make it from point A to point B it means like increase the amplifier, make it louder. And if we all know from the dinner table, screaming doesn't make your point you get across. <laughs> but even the variations of signal noise, all of these haven't really been formed yet. Right. The solution to noise, the solution to a noisy channel or, or distortion was just to talk louder, brute forcing the problem. <coughs> uh, and, and Shannon discusses ways to get around that by talking smarter and in code. But this breakthrough seems it, it's not like others because, you know, the problem goes back to the 1890s and the telegraph. And he himself had sort of been formulating it over this 10 year journey of of thinking about it. Yeah, he actually wrote a note to uh, to Vannevar Bush, uh, first suggesting that he was working on this, the, the theory that all messages or all communications were essentially the same. This is 10 years before he ever publishes the paper. And it is kind of interesting to think of this idea like marinating in his brain as he's traveling through different parts of his life. The other, the other important point is that he takes, it takes 10 years for these things to crystallize. Uh, we tend to want very quick reactions to things. Uh, we think, you know, that the, the, the moment our tweet goes up, if it, if it doesn't get responded to, oh God, what have I done? Uh, <laughs> for Claude Shannon, this was 10 years, often working at night and on the weekends, thinking, pondering, writing things down, scribbling, uh, and then eventually coming back and, and dropping a theory that when it was announced, people said it, it came like a bomb. Yeah, that's actually, to me, that's it's just very refreshing to hear. <coughs> well. But it also took many, many years. Sometimes history has a tendency to tell everything. Like it, it happened on Tuesday and then the paper gets published. But what was the big assumption that he made in his theory of communication that, that really sort of changed everybody's mind? I'd say there are a few things. A lot of the history of information up to Shannon w- was this question of abstraction. How can we get away from the, the meaning that any message has and think about messages in a more objective way? How can you measure the information content of a message? And uh, Shannon's predecessors, uh, people like uh, Nyquist and Hartley, had been sort of groping to a solution to this problem, as had many others in the field. But it, it's Shannon who really comes up with the final formulation uh, of how do you quantify information? What does it even mean to say how much information is in a book? How much information is it a song? How much information is in a video or so on? And then what Shannon does in introducing the bit, uh, which he starts off calling the binary digit uh, before uh, one of his colleagues uh, comes up with bit as a good abbreviation. Um, what, what Shannon does is he talks about how we can think about information uh, as uh, resolved uncertainty and how we can think about information uh, probabilistically and how we can uh, use these tools to actually uh, calculate information in a really objective way. And then once we do that, once we can actually do hard science with our messages that uh, enormously simplifies the problems of uh, compression and accurate communication. But this uh, first step, getting past that semantic level and getting to the objective quality of information, um, I, I think that's a key in the whole paper. It, you know, we do look back and go like the bit came out of the paper. At the time, was that like viewed as sort of a key innovation or when people had the elevator conversation about the paper, what was the elevator conversation? That he had set some outer limits for what engineers would would try to do, that the paper was a model of clarity and concision, that he had, ex- that he had explained all possible forms of communication in a sort of single diagram. Um, and that he had done it all without anyone knowing that he had no collaborators of of, re- of any of any kind, uh, and that it was published in two two sections within the Bell Technical Journal, the Bell Systems Technical Journal. What we take from the paper only starts to matter in the eighties, uh, and so at the time this was still a discussion, very much in theory, but the power and force of his theory was was immediately seen. One of my the things that I loved that I didn't know was that the two first two papers are called A Mathematical Theory of, Com- of Communication. And then when he went to write his own book, he changed it to The Mathematical Theory of Communication. What actually transpired in the, the interview <coughs> there? One of us have gotten some pretty good feedback on it. You know, this is the theory, is the theory that he had stumbled on the paper. Uh, the, the, um, I think also the question of Warren Weaver, who comes 
oh, Don great. Shane, who's a co-author for the book, um, who is sort of a science popularizer. And he's also someone who's very, uh, uh, like Bush, uh, he probably doesn't describe himself as having a first-rate scientific mind, but he's someone who loves literature. He collects translations of Alice in Wonderland and supposedly uh, can identify uh, wine varietals by tasting. So he's just a sort of renaissance man. And he comes on um, encouraging Shannon to take this to press and uh, writing a section of the book that's sort of a, a layperson's explanation of what information theory is. People think that Weaver, in some ways, is a co-originator of the theory, and he was always in a hurry to downplay that and to say, no, I just uh, was the popularizer. One of the things that's interesting, too, is that you know he's 32 when he writes the, the paper in 1948, and, but all along, you know, people like Weaver played an important role in helping him like, basically finish his work. He was very careful about the people that he let into his orbit. So part I'm of curious. <clears throat> if you have a stealth on a taunt, he sort of kept to himself. Nope, they can just hit you. Got it. <laughs> Thought that meant I would get something out of it. Just means that I lose. Okay. It was, it was an interesting idea. Is computer. She is a computer at Bell Labs, and what that meant was that she was helping engineers do math. She herself was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate. <coughs> what is it? But what was in Douglas Women's College, what is now Rutgers, she's got a lot of talent. She publishes herself. She's a musician, and uh, Shannon, shy though he is, like starts talking to her. They start dating, and they're a, they're a match right away. Uh, people just understand that when they're together, it's a different kind of connection. Uh, and they connect interpersonally, but they also connect mathematically. She does help him uh, complete his work. <gasps> Shannon was the kind of person who would see solutions. They connect that, mathematically. Like, think about problems and then see the end state. And he wasn't actually that interested in like explaining to other people how he got to that end state. And I, I guess when you're as smart as Claude Shannon, you're kind of allowed to get away with that. But uh, Betty Shannon understood that in order for Claude Shannon to have the kind of impact he was going to have, the work would need to get finished. So she would actually sit with him. A lot of his earliest papers are in her handwriting. Uh, and she would she would do the math, do, do the intervening math. She would challenge him. She would um, include historical references, liter literary references in papers. And she never got Wait. any credit for. Someone immediately uh, conceded. And, and hopefully, you know, our work starts to restore that a bit. But, but oh, and it got me to the next level. Well, so that, that was kind of a lame way to get there. <laughs> oh no, it didn't. Uh, I think that's. I mean, I think that's uh, a fantastic point. Is to, to the tiniest bit. Uh, we learn. We know the same thing about uh, Pierre Marie Curie. And the same thing about Einstein and, and Maleva and, and so on. Amazing foundation gets laid. And this career, he won many awards that he never seemed to seek out in his later years. He ended up meeting like many of the progeny of the computing era. At one point, he ends up meeting Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. how, how did that come about? So this is a story that was relayed to us by, by Claude. I like how that's like the pinnacle. And, uh, it, it's a, it's an he met Steve moment. Jobs. Both Steve Jobs and Claude are, are the recipients of uh, honorary degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. And after the, the when, when is this? I believe it's the 1980s. After the ceremony, Hello. The, the people are sort of milling about the quad. Face hunters. If you can imagine Claude Shannon at this point by the 80s, because his work has started to actually be implemented. I mean, he's won a national medal. He's a revered. We're listening to a podcast called our mind at play to making the information age figure so there's a crowd around him it's at the end and people want to sort of be open to suggestions from yeah, second Jobs podcasts well known, but not as well known as he is now and so steve jobs actually it's going well he, he goes uh i'm losing terribly because that's how i how i do his audience with claude shannon he has to, he has if you to have any the other way around. suggestions or want to help me it's a real honor to meet you to not lose Steve Jobs, I work at, at Apple Computer. That'd be helpful. And That'd be great. Says, great, Steve. It's nice to meet you. What do you do at Apple? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's an incredible moment. Steve Jobs actually sends the Shannons. Uh, he assembles an Apple II and sends it to Claude. So they you can't tell how bad I am yet because I only played one card. Assembled by uh, Steve Jobs himself. And it's a real point of pride later for them. It's a kind of funny moment in, in computing history that these two giants met. I really wanted to pull a couple of quotes about him from... I'm still learning about the game. I, I found them just so telling, and also help us to reflect on our own culture. You know, one person said, uh, he never argued his ideas. If people didn't believe in them, he just ignored those people. <laughs> so that has that, That's just that hidden. sort of Silicon Valley... Yeah, thing. I'm new. Right. He, he, as Jimmy I'm was very saying, new. Sort of I'm just trying to level up my characters at this point, and I'll also learn as I do it. Like, so I don't know what a lot of the... Cards mean quite yet. Uh, he 
would very politely excuse himself and he'd go back to his office and work on whatever he was working on or he'd start uh, unicycling down the uh, hallway to get away from you. Yeah, I love the unicycling only because that seems to have roots in PC era as well. Claude Shannon, to my mind, one of the most interesting things about him is he just spends his entire life pursuing the problems that interest him most. And then the moment that he's taken them, as far as he'd like to take them, he goes on and chases a different problem. So it, it's interesting, right? Because he could have continued to trade on information theory for decades. He had the opportunity to be a scientific Oh, scientist. I know. He's got a thingy. He was, even, he was profiled in Vogue magazine. Uh, I mean, he had a oh. suit and everything, a cigarette, the whole deal. And he just, he sort of walks off the stage, but pursues artificial intelligence, then pursues robotics, goes and builds a chess playing machine. Uh, builds an artificially intelligent mouse that can navigate a maze. I, I, what I find inspiring about him is this is someone who had lucrative I don't know. options and almost always went for the problem that interested him most. Well, I really want to thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. And so this was Jimmy Sony and Rob Goodman, co-authors of Mind at Play, How Claude Shannon Invented the Information Age. Thank you. How do I find that out? Thanks. This is great. Yeah, thank you for having us. Is that important? the home stretch and quarter number four on the keystone kickoff show brought to you by the keystone sports network get the best penn state sports news and analysis at keystonesportsnetwork.com or download the keystone sports app from your smartphone hmm. welcome back to the keystone kickoff show brought to you by the keystone sports network dustin howard smith here back again with greg oh. this is ask greg welcome to the a16z podcast we're gonna listen to an Mm, okay, what's your battle tag? <laughs> RG Bubs, one, 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 two, two, four. <clears throat> oh. Well, that was unfortunate for him. Can people spectate you even if you don't add them? I have no idea. I want to turn my sound back on, but I can't get to it because it's this thing. Oh, there we go. Not looking great. Oh, that sucks. Um. Hmm. Did I kill this guy? Probably the higher one. Well, if you see anything, <laughs> you can just kind of observe from here. <laughs> Wait, can you, ob you can't play, but can you observe? Oh, it just isn't looking good for me. Oh, this is not looking good. What did that do? Oh, he, he healed everybody. Great. Yeah, no. Ooh, you can't even observe on a different server? That's so annoying. Uh. I could do a charge. For the king! <clears throat> For the king!
spy taunt hit me. Voices in VR. Okay, I'm gonna put on some voices in VR. The latest episode? Consciousness research. It's kind of interesting. <coughs> hmm. Yeah, I would like to just hurt them at this point, considering I'm not doing so well. That helped. That helped. Um. Wish I had more. <laughs> Oh, that's death rattle add a random dragon card to your hand so should i get rid of the beast or should i get rid of the dragon oh that will kill me this won't kill me oh i'll just hit him then oh i got down to one at least that's something okay you're as a reality turing test i'm not curious as to like Oh, hey! Magic gallery show featured art created entirely in VR. Listen to that one! <clears throat> so I met Nick, and I've seen some of his stuff. So I think I'll listen to a podcast about Magic Gallery, M-A-G-I-K. Yeah, Nick Ochoa. Put him in the description, too. Welcome to the Voices of VR podcast. <coughs> I think one of the biggest boons of virtual reality is that there's new tools to be able to create 3D content using virtual reality. We've had Did he not get rid of hitting me? Premiered at GDC <laughs> 2015, was acquired by Google, and has now gone through like 12 different versions with increasing amounts of features and functionality. There's the kind of the equivalent to Tilt Brush on Oculus side is Quill, which is like these 2D illustrations. But they also have Oculus Medium, which is to do 3D objects in sculpting. And just today, Google announced that they're mm. releasing Blocks, which is their equivalent to Medium. It's like a sculpting tool, but it's more low poly. It's more akin to like building with Blocks is Lego bricks. <coughs> and it's kind of designed for beginners to be able to create. Blocks is okay. But overall, there's all these... It's a little bit limited. And there's been a number of artists who have taken to virtuality as their primary medium to be able to create art. And back on May 20th, Nick Ochoa created the Magic Gallery showing that was happening in San Francisco. He gathered all of these... I'm so sad I couldn't go to that. ...that are using virtuality as their primary medium to create art. And he wanted to bring them all together and for a show such that he could bring people from the outside who may not already have virtuality headsets and could be some of their first VR experiences. And he wanted those first experiences to be exploring some of these art pieces that were created in a number of these different VR art programs. So I had a chance to drop by the day before the showing. I was in town for the Google I.O. And oh. I saw a number of different pieces and had a chance to catch up with Nick, talking about what he was trying to do with the Magic Gallery. So that's what we'll be covering on today's episode of the Voices of VR podcast. So this conversation happened on Friday, May 19th, 2017 mm. in San Francisco, California. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. My name is Nick Ochoa. I've been in VR for a little while now. Hi, Nick. Since about middle of 2014. <laughs> and we're doing Magic Gallery, which is an arts first organization. But what we're trying to do really is change the dialogue of a lot of the industry, take the attention away from the games and the minutia of the tech and focus it more on the artists and the creators themselves yeah. and allow their work, specifically their artwork, things that they're making in Quill or Medium and Tilt Brush and Mind Show and all these other amazing creative tools, put that front and center. Let's make that the first introduction to VR for most people. And that's why we're building out this gallery, Magic Gallery, because it's an art show. It's an art exhibition first, VR second. The VR is the canvas, but 
the content itself. I think you'd be interested story, in our and the artists themselves thing are that we have important. an idea for. So we're really looking forward to actually bring people into VR without having to talk about VR. Yeah, so I, I've been to at least one other exhibition for VR experiences, which is the Death and Dying show that was here in San Francisco. This yeah, guy's going to murder me. on showing experiences of people getting together in the physical <laughs> space. But this Definitely feels like it may lost. actually be one of the first art <coughs> shows that is showing art that was created within VR. So maybe you could talk a bit about that dimension of what you're doing here. Yeah, so the Can most powerful thing about VR to me having been in this industry for a while now, is the way it allows us to author and create things that, was a cool move. that were before either really difficult to make, required a lot of previous literacy, technical literacy. And now I die. Oculus Medium, for example. <laughs> to create 3D assets with a keyboard and mouse was really difficult, it took a long time, and you had to use expensive bloated software like Maya or ZBrush. And now in Medium, people are reaching out with digital Well, I'm going to be trying hologram to today, so hopefully that's taken easier weeks than in, what in he's minutes. talking about. And that, to me, speaks volumes to the power Being of virtual reality Being VR too long makes me medium. feel sick. So this event and the curation of dizzying. the content is focused around content made in VR. I think that these tools, above all, are what matter in this space and enabling content creators to have fun making these types of 3D assets and get more creative with the, the way they work with their imaginations is what I think in the future we're going to look back and recognize as okay. the true <laughs> powerful potential uh, presented by this medium. And so the art show is intended to put that type of content oh, from amazing artists I like at least got to Wesley level 10. Allsbrook, who's showing a couple pieces, who illustrated <coughs> the line of Dear Angelica, Take like of anything Steve Teeps, who's doing some That's amazing a cool work car. in and That's in, really uh, high. Tilt Brush and Liz it's Edwards, cool who's also doing amazing stuff. <coughs> I mean, she's in Quill, she's in Medium, she's in Tilt Brush, she's a total badass. And Su Gwen, who comes from the fine art world, she kind of hops from one exhibition to the next, one artist in residency program to the next, and she's integrating virtual reality into her process of mark making and creating her her different types of pieces. So, for me, this is. Also, Danny Bittman. I don't know if you want to oh, leave. Yeah, yeah, Danny Bittman as well. well. You can go to the website, check out the list, or, or if you're around, it, it's happening Saturday, May 20th. And the artists that we have are all truly incredible and doing things beyond just VR. Like Danny's exporting into Unity and he's adding new elements in his tilt brush scenes. Kabibo, he did an entire picture book, Delilah's Gift, where he illustrated his stories in tilt brush and then he. I don't know what other word to use, but Khabibified him and added all of his crazy <laughs> shader loveliness and made it something that otherwise would, words can't describe. That's why it's called magic, right? Like, we, we, you can't believe what's in front of your eyes half the time. And this is something that once people step in, I think it's really going to give them not only a new appreciation of virtual reality, but of art and creative opportunities for themselves and people they know. So th this is... This is really important to me, moving the dialogue away from gaming and more towards creators and this user-generated content. And I hope that we're able to prove that through this Made in VR art show. Yeah, as I had a chance to go through a number of the different experiences, I noticed a, a couple of trends of what makes VR art different than other art. And one of which it's is the sense of scale that you get in some of these drawings of scale. being able right. to see the giant <laughs> nature of being fully immersed in a scene and seeing what you can do with that scale. But also Danny Bittman um, in particular and some of the worlds that he's creating that it's less about doing it in an individual like 3D model or something, but it's an entire world. It's like the world building and it's yeah. kind of like taking landscape photography, but adding that sense of landscape to the world that you're Which creating to be able to create that volumetric sense um, and, and an ambiance that you get from the entire environment beyond just sort of a small object that you're creating. So yeah, I'm just curious to hear other trends that you were seeing as you were curating the show. The scale is hugely important, especially for things like sculpture and medium. It's really, really, really expensive to make a giant sculpt in marble or in... <laughs> metal or That's really true, true. any medium that isn't digital because you have all the material costs. It's also really expensive to create a, a mural compared to I being able really to do it in something really like cool Tilt Brush and 
you can instantly scale it up and boom, you got a mural or you got something that could fit in like your wallet, right? It's one of the more powerful pieces. The other thing is just being able to move through it, right? So something that we're doing for this show that I think is unique, at least I haven't seen it before, we're trying to get away from displaying the piece when it's being viewed through a monitor. Because for me, what I've noticed in doing so many different events, when people witness that through the monitor and they see that you can move through it, they kind of get a sense that they know what's going on. And it doesn't really invite them to put the headset on themselves and try it. So to get away from that, we're sort of turning the monitors the other direction. And we have 2D prints that we've done. We've taken photographs in these scenes. And we're using that as a sort of, it's less of like a painting. It's more of a memory. It's like if you were to go on a trip to Paris or, or go on vacation in Australia and you're taking a photo of a moment that you had at a museum, that photo becomes your memory. That's what these prints are. When you look at that photo, it doesn't just stand for itself as a photo. It's actually a snapshot of that world that you were just in. So something like Danny Bittman's piece, his Atlas piece, this beautiful giant world. Very cute. And there's infinite perspectives that you can have on it through manipulation of scale, through bouncing around to the different sections of the environment. And being able to take some of those perspectives, print them, and share them as a memory, as an artifact that people who are attending this event can take home with them, I think is going to be incredibly powerful because when they hang that in their room or in their office and someone asks them about it, it's no longer just, oh, this is a a painting. It's like, no, this is a... Let me tell you the story about when I was exploring this world, oh, and here's a photo that represents my, it. My it goes much deeper. So that, to me, is, is crucial. It's very <laughs> crucial. Because it proves that we can take this artwork that's made in VR, but we can extend it beyond I'll VR. It could become beautiful photography. It could become beautiful paintings and imagery that becomes flat, right? Because the story component is so deeply tied to that experience. Once you step in, you have that memory forever. So it's exciting to see that, one, the prints look, like, so good. They they came out amazing. Is he still in SF? And two, now the artists have a way to give people a little bit more access into their work, even though they're making it in VR. And usually people can't, most people can't come see it in VR, right? That access is a real issue. That's why we're doing a gallery. But now there's a story, (coughs) and people can take that, and they can look at this 2D print and say, oh, I can't wait till I can see that in VR. But I'm... I'm very, very, very interested to see what happens as a result of more artists coming into this event and like trying these tools for the first time. Most events around VR are VR events, and it's just all VR. Conferences have all these different things. You get five-minute demos, and you don't really get a chance to play. What we're doing, we have 15 different riffs. We have a handful of vibes, and during the full day, moments, people are going to be able to not only witness the work, but they're going to be able to create on all of those 15 stations. And we're inviting in a lot of local artists. So who knows what's to come? Like, there's some hidden talent out there that we have no idea what they're capable of in VR because they've never been in VR. So that, to me, is probably the most exciting part of this. I can't wait to see what comes of it. Yeah, another thing that I I noticed as I was going through these different experiences and hearing how you're going to be setting up this gallery is that I often think about the VR ecosystem as having like three prongs of a stool. You have the technology, you have the content, and then you have the audience. And I feel like here we've had the technology out there. We've had the innovations with both Oculus Medium as well as Quill as well as Tiltbrush to be able to have the technology to give to the artists to create the content. And now this is sort of that third prong of having people watch and view these experiences, but yet this may be their first experience. They don't know how to use the controller, so they don't even know how to necessarily see the content yet, which is limiting what kind of content is being created and what can be shown. So it feels like you're kind of closing that loop and being able to give access to some of these experiences, but yet we're still iterating on that process of the technology with the well, content. And then now, we're, instead of iterating between the technology and the content, that's being stabilized. Now we're going between the content and the audiences. So true. You nailed it. The controllers, I'll harp on the input a little bit because that's something that we're, we're doing for this. It's Input's important. Don't get me wrong. Without it, we couldn't make any of this work, right? But when it's the first time in VR, 
putting on the headset is enough. Trying to figure out, okay, how do I use this controller? Like, oh wait, I just clicked a button. What do I do now? It becomes this really Good. long education process, and that education process, the content itself sort of becomes secondary because your brain's so occupied. So what we've done is we've set up these benches, and they're about ten feet away from the the prints. And you're looking at this print, and then you have a headset on the bench mm -hmm. next to you. And when you put it on, you can now step into that print. And we've set the scene, so you'll have 10 feet by 10 feet of space to navigate that world. But for these first-time users, we're not going to give them controls because they don't need them necessarily. They only distract from the work. And in trying to close the gap around the first experience, what's the story of that first experience, is it my first experience because I was at some VR conference trying a demo? Is someone's first tilt brush experience, does it always have to be them creating something in tilt brush? I don't think so. There's a lot more opportunity in VR than we give credit as a way of displaying it at least. So we do want to change that. We want to show that this technology is just as compelling when you're in it without having total control, but you're using it as a canvas. It is a canvas, right? And canvas is almost this archaic word at this point because it's more than a canvas. But I don't, I haven't found the word for it. I guess magic is like the only thing that I could feel like encompasses this emotion that comes from these types of experiences. But I think it's a little bit like awe, awe-inspiring in some way of, of, of vastness. That's the sort of some ways that I think about it, at least. The C Corp is called Vast Group, right? <laughs> magic is the name of this event, but it is vast. It's infinite. It invokes curiosity. It excites wonder. It, it gets you really thinking about things in a way that you never had an opportunity to think about them until you've gained that perspective, that dimension that's provided by VR. And and so uh, what what is your intention of kind of the, the best possible outcome for doing this uh, exhibition here with the, the Magic Gallery? For this event, this is the first event that we're doing. And the expectation really is get people thinking about this when they think about VR. Like, I want people to share their experience, their first experience with That's VR. That's what I said. Not just talking about how cool some game was or some 360 video that they saw. But I think that these tools really do encapsulate the full potential of virtual reality as a medium. 100%. Nothing does a better job. No, there's no better demo than like a tilt brush demo or a quill demo or a medium demo as a first demo. And but everybody what? knows that. Oh. And yet we still don't provide opportunities for people to go Sorry, and Sean. witness and experience these things like tilt brush as their first real experience. It's, it's really disappointing to see what a lot of the industry has done in that sense, especially <coughs> on the event side. Bro? It's not about just everything related to VR, I don't think. Like, if we really want to drive home a point, yeah, if a we really want to get people paying attention and listening, like let's put a little oh, bit good, more focus laugh. and more story yeah, okay. around the true potential. <laughs> and these artists you, are the ones who are expressing that. So we're here to help tell their stories. And the it's best possible so outcome is to help those stories go as far as we possibly can. And in return, that we'll bring more people into me, VR. And hopefully this starts oh, integrating into existing okay, galleries and museums and goes international. But we don't know what's okay, going to happen as a result. Damage, I can only I can hope that damage, people so walk away three, with their minds blown three, so Darren, with four, new, fresh all. eyes on the world and a drive Plus, to jump in there and him? start creating something for themselves. Right? Yeah, because you know we're here in San Francisco okay, in an actual again. gallery yeah. that you're having oh, people come here in they reality. Can. But because it's virtual art, have you thought about exporting into like some sort of unity project such that you could have like this virtual <laughs> version of this art show for people to see all the art pieces in their own headsets? Sure, yeah, that's an opportunity, most definitely. Now and some people are exploring that lightly. Uh, Colin Northwood. Oh, it kills me too. There, and he's kind of <laughs> Forgot about that, that attack stuff. first. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, had to pop into one of their uh, tests <laughs> I dealt four damage. some of the art that was there. It was super Wait. compelling to, to go to an art show gallery with these kind of like floating um, box heads that were running up. I'm but it was really compelling to see like... the 3D art that was being shown there. Totally. I had so much fun. It was oh. actually the first time I saw oh, Kibibo's uh, Ring Grub Island. <laughs> and I met Colin I really in like Ring Grub Island, it, which was really just sweet. I couldn't pay attention to most of what he was saying because I was so taken back by Ring Grub Island. But it's a great example of, of how that can go. But for me, it's not about pandering to the people who already own I'm VR. It's about reaching this. new people. And it's about getting it's taking a while for me to lose, though. 
less likely to sign. experience virtual reality because they're not going to show up to some tech conference to get them into these experiences and prove to them that it's something that they need right now and that's very useful. But yes, like putting it all into VR, uh, there's definitely some problems to be solved there. They're built on different platforms, and it's you can't just easily export. My Sketchfab is doing a wonderful as to job. I had a podcast playing in the background. Helping people take their scenes. <laughs> Please tell me that's just going to kill me. Deal floor damage to VR. an enemy. But oh, for me, that's great. not the focus. You didn't right need now. to hurt the other the one. The focus right now is on getting this into real world spaces and aligning it with the fine art world, aligning it as a piece that could sit in the MoMA, in the Guggenheim, in the Met. Like these are the real opportunities to get people like experiencing VR in a meaningful way. We have to align <coughs> it with these types of organizations. We can't AR. keep patting each other on the I'm back. I'm not that sad about it. And I'm so not that surprised. It's an opportunity. Maybe we'll explore it. What's GG but mean? But right now, that's definitely not oh. the focus. It's getting Thank you. That's real really sweet. In real world spaces. <laughs> it was to a, check out art. It was, a, it was something. Great. And uh, and finally, what do you think is kind of the ultimate potential of virtual reality and what it might be able to enable? Jason, it's a giant question. Okay. PG, it's a very big question. <laughs> I think for me, having played with these tools, having spoken with these artists, the real potential does lie in the creative aspects, the way that we make things, the way that we experience each other's stories. It's not just 360 video. Like the real world's really awesome already. Yeah, 360 video is so limited. VR still has a long way to go. So capturing <coughs> the real world and putting it into VR, it only mm. goes so far. But these tools, I think, show the full potential. They show how vast of a canvas this can be and how many different types of content, unique types of content, can come out of it. So there's not one way to tell a story. And I think that virtual reality is opening up more doors, more pathways towards telling these stories than anything else. And look, artists have been reaching for something like VR for forever. Like humanity, technological evolution, our mediating tools and technology, it's all in the same little boat, right? We're only as good as the tools we have. And virtual reality is a tool set. And thinking about it as a creative tool set, as a way of working with our imaginations, as a, that to me is the true potential of virtual reality. So I hope to see more people making tools. I hope to see more artists utilizing them. And I hope to see more supporters of those artists from individual level to attack. the larger organization level. Got to attack. So, yeah, I think that's where I'll put my hard stop. <laughs> Anything else left unsaid that you'd like to say? You know, I'm just excited I'm that good. as long as we've in this VR <laughs> industry, meaning like anybody who's probably listening to this podcast, as long as we've been I in this space, more streams where it's still are so fresh. Or like, like, what's it called? These tools Spectating are V1s, right? Like, actually helping and already so look at what they're enabling. Just imagine, like imagine what's to come in two years, three years, five years, when we start integrating okay, new technology, this. new inputs to help make these tools even more powerful. It's better, so, guys. VR can feel slow sometimes when you've been in it for a little while. Yeah. It can feel like we're just going down the same Look, path, I, I same old thing. I don't know if this thing. guy's that good. He's just kind of stacking up like, in it's, right now. it's just getting started. We just sort of have to turn around and, and look at the other mm -hmm. end of it because it's really easy to get that tunnel vision. But there's a lot of oh, well, really that's amazing one way to go. opportunities out there. There's a lot of artists so who deserve to have him. access to this technology that have yet to have that access. And I'm personally incredibly excited. I feel like we're at the beginning again with all of this. And I hope it continues to He's feel that way. He's not doing but, great right yeah. now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. That's good of for course. Me. Thank you, Kent. And thanks for stopping by today. So that was Nick Ochoa of the Magic Gallery, and they had their initial art gallery showing in San Francisco on May 20th, 2017. So I have a number of different takeaways about this interview is that, uh, first of all, uh, Nick is a patron of the arts. He wants to mm -hmm. support artists creating virtual reality. He Hell wants yeah. to make it such that they're able to have a viable living of being able to create art within virtual reality, but also to use art and virtual reality to be able to promote VR as a medium and to give people some of their first experiences in VR by actually creating VR. And I think Nick is absolutely right. Some of the most compelling virtuality experiences that you could have is in tilt brush of being myself. able to actually draw around. It's just so natural and intuitive, and it's an experience that you've never been able to have before, which is like you're painting with light in three dimensions. 
Now, on the other hand, uh, some yeah. of the controllers are difficult for first-time users What's to that use, mean? and I have also found that as well. Some of the experiences that were being shown at the Magic Gallery were a lot better if you were able to navigate Help around me. and kind of locomote throughout the scene. Wait, this? Not having that, I think there's something that is lost oh, a little bit hero power. not fully appreciating the full scale of the experience. But also, some of these art pieces were still in the native, like, tilt brush or quill and the locomotion mechanisms within those programs are are actually not very intuitive for first-time users and so in the future stupid? though as they get exported and put him? into something like unity or eventually perhaps something like web vr i'm just gonna there could him. be like more natural user interfaces for being able to locomote but also i think it's just an education was that for okay people who are looking at these experiences to just have a number of experiences to know some Yay! of the teleportation mechanics and then from that good. point it's just going to be easier to create more and more complicated vr pieces because i the one common thing that i saw amongst all the different vr oh. pieces was the use of scale <clears throat> well, because that's something that's just honestly it's not very impressive I mean, if you're going to be looking at it's something in like VR, you're there. not going to want to just look at a table that you could see in i, should, I could just you kill see them that is so vast and awe-inspiring that you've never been able to I see i could just kill them all life. and hurt him and i think that's the strength of art is that within stupid VR, is like this huge a bunch of ones on the board it's annoying inspires the sense of awe and wonder and I think that there's some artists like Danny Bittman. I've just been really Morgan enjoying some of the work that he's been doing in terms of world down. building, where he's really exporting things into Unity and really building out entire I mean, vast worlds life. that you can really start to explore around. And with blocks that we've just released, charge. I'm oh. super excited to start to dive in because I have found myself <coughs> forgot like I should hit him facing this challenge where you go into even like tilt brush or medium or quill, and there's still a certain amount of artistic skill that you have to have. Oh, go to you his can face. still kind of go feel like face. you're awesome go to his by face being and to paint, face. You know, these lines around yourself. But when it comes to producing ah, something that it, is I got it, I got it, I got it. a lot of people, then it is actually pretty difficult. And I'm excited for Blocks just as a program to be able to go in there and maybe oh prototype something quickly and to get it into yeah, yeah. a virtual reality experience that is actually optimized for VR. Okay, now they have it's plus low two. poly and it's going to just be a little bit better suited to creating these vast worlds and not having to worry about drawing something that has too many polygons and it's just not going to be performant or functional within a, a larger VR experience. But overall, there is this ecosystem that I think is developing for artists who are using these virtual reality tools to create art. In a review of Blocks that was written up by Danny Bittman in VR Scout, he said that there are a number of different VR artists who are able to I mean, make a yeah. living off of doing VR art for commissions. Use your people's. And there's also more and more different outlets for art within the virtual reality scene. The Magic Gallery is one of the first showings that i've seen that is featuring pieces that were created oh entirely just anyone who's next to him reality. at any point in time but there's also other art shows that just happened one. in new york city last week with uh, the vr society at the sotheby's they had the vr and new york art show there's a number of different vr pieces that are okay, showing so... at art galleries i know that at <laughs> the sf moma that was happening during gdc you know, there was a vr him. art program that was featuring a number of different oh. pieces including one by Kabibo. Good point. And Alejandro Gonzalez and Nier 2 has Get this him. Carne y Arena piece mm. that's oh, showing at the do that. Los Angeles after, County Museum of Art. I think and that, that is I like that basically better. sold out until like September. And so starting to show these different VR pieces within a museum context, I think is going to start happening more and, and now more. he's and scared. I think there's like a huge It's nice to be on the other side of this, not experience. losing. <laughs> there's a number of other different VR art things that I've seen within the last month or two. I know that... At VR LA, uh, Zach Kruznak had the VR Galactic Gallery. I think that's an application that's going to be being released on Steam at some time soon. Uh, VR that? Chat just had an art what showing in the that? Affinity VR Art Gallery. And uh, Colin Northway, as mentioned in the podcast, was also working on some applications that were kind of like a low-fidelity avatar representation <laughs> that you're able to have a social experience, but you're I'm in so the excited context that I won of one. a lot of immersive 3D. Do you know how long it's taken? So the VR Scout suggested <laughs> me to win one. did an excellent write-up. <laughs> I've played Gallery. like five games already. Called it a landmark At least event for immersive six, art. maybe more? He did I don't a know. more specific it's been a while since I won. all the different VR art pieces that was there. I dropped by the day before yes, and didn't get a chance to see every that. single piece, yes, but he's got a pretty cute. comprehensive collection of both the art and some of the 2D images that were produced okay. that were being distributed at the art gallery. So keep an eye on Nick and the Magic Gallery for what's happening in the world of <laughs> VR. I love the emojis. And, you know, pushing that Twitch. into the wider fine arts art world. So I don't that's use all this that I have for today. I, feel like I, I just should. wanted to thank you for listening to the Voices of VR podcast. And 
If you enjoy the podcast, then please do spread the word. Tell should your I friends. Should I keep listening to a podcast or should I put on my game? Interested in getting into VR, send them Noise. this episode that they can check out People some of the watching. pieces that are out there and check in to uh, some of the artists that are out there creating some VR art and posting it to like their Twitter. One. It's highly recommended to check out and kind of keep abreast to what's happening in this realm. And uh, if you like to support the podcast, okay. then uh, please do consider becoming a donor. You can uh, donate today at patreon.com slash oh, VR. Thanks for listening. Greetings. I don't really need to restore my health yet. This is just put down a... <clears throat> That's a good idea. I should uh, adjust my deck. I haven't done it for this guy at all, actually. Got five health? I don't know what a curve is. Click bait. <laughs> I was just listening to a VR podcast. I'm going to put on another one, though. So many possibilities. Mm. Yeah, I just listened to Nick Ochoa's podcast, or Nick Ochoa's featured in a VR podcast. Uh, I don't know what to do. I'm going to hit him out of fear. Woohoo! Uh, what do you mean I can't do that? Let me do it. No! Oh, it's when you spend all your money each turn. See, now I'm learning the words. Hmm. Oh, shoot. Let me see what podcasts I can get on here now. Some very interesting ones. Diversity in VR. Ooh, projection mapped immersive theater shows future of live AR performances. That one have to do maybe. We will skip that one. Um, using VR to diagnose and treat concussions. Okay, that's interesting. <clears throat> Voices of VR Podcast. My name is Kent Bai, and welcome to the oh, Voices I done of this VR and Podcast. Done that. So on today's episode, we're going to be looking at a Hi. startup company called Sync. Thanks for watching. And they've solved a problem that has been undefinable in other realms. And that has to do with concussions. So there's not even an official diagnosis or therapy for concussions because so much of a concussion happens inside of your head and it's a subjective experience where you are having different variations of attention or focus or balance, but it's actually something that's very difficult to articulate. And so when it comes to impact sports like football, soccer, hockey, rugby, we have these players who are forced to give these subjective accounts of what's happening inside of their body, but they may not even be able to account for that. So virtual reality plus eye tracking is able to pierce I'm inside of somebody's responsive. mind and start to measure their attention in a way that's like emotionally objective. responsive. So they're able to come up with a framework right to be able to detect and diagnose and treat both concussions and brain traumas. So I'm going to be talking to Dan Beeler. He's the CTO of SyncThink on today's episode of the Voices of VR podcast. And this interview happened at TechCrunch Disrupt. It had a whole bunch of different startups and a little section there for VR startups in particular. And this was back on Monday, September 12, 2016 in San Francisco, California. This is so where it would have been nice that, to have that. Let's go ahead and dive Destroy right everything. Well. My name is Dan Beeler. I'm CTO at SyncThink. It's a Boston company. And we make a medical device that tracks your eye movements. It's an eye tracking device. It's a portable device that you can bring on the sidelines. So the state of the art for concussion is largely subjective. So you can think of a field sobriety test. 
It's manual, subjective, easily gamed, variable. So there just aren't good tools out there to provide quality information to these medical professionals. That's where we come in and provide a fast assessment that characterizes your eye movements with respect to a simple moving target. Uh, you can think of it as a way to figure out how well you synchronize compared to a predictable target. And the assessment is about 60 seconds and it provides an objective piece of information for the medical professional at the point of incident and as a monitor thereafter during recovery. Yeah, so you have this kind of mobile setup here. It's got this briefcase with like a tablet, I'm presuming like Windows 10 Surface tablet with a Oculus Rift DK2 and SMI trackers built into it and kind of have this whole setup to be able to be mobile, portable, and open it up on the side of either the sidelines of a athletics or out in the field in the military, it sounds like. Yeah, that's right. So we're packing a lot of technology into a single briefcase. The whole system weighs about 15 pounds. And uh, yeah, that's right. So we build with our partners SMI this eye tracking technology into these VR platforms. That's not good. connected to a Surface Pro tablet computer. The tablet serves as the it's user interface, like the data seconds. storage, the computation, and the battery. So it's really just those two main components, but really it's a lot of technology in a single device. Yeah, I know that uh, a lot of the minimum specifications for oh, running uh, normal really kind of Oculus Rift games are pretty now. high, but yet this is a pretty simplistic actual VR well experience where it's essentially just a dot that's I'm moving around. Nice. And the main part of the VR technology part is being able to actually just track the me. eyes as correlating to where the dot is moving in to where the eyes are actually tracking it. And so from that, you're able to kind of output a number of different graphs that are kind of like a circle if you're able to follow it correctly and then kind of a concentrated dot. And if people do have a concussion, you just have some photos of things here. Of just looks like very erratic. And uh, maybe and you could just maybe describe to me some of these different results of how you are able to look at this and tell whether or not someone may be suffering a concussion or not. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, it's a very simple paradigm. You know, we're not eye tracking with gaming in this device. That's a bit too much for a mobile platform. But we output two primary visualizations. There's one that shows your eye <coughs> movements relative to the display in front of you, the center of the display. I don't like this card. So for circular motion of the target, your eyes should look roughly circular in its motion. And then we also put a second uh, visualization, which aggregates your eye movements relative to the target. And this one's much more interesting. And this is what we look at from the clinical perspective. Let me break this down to two That's components. Nice There's your eye motion inwards and outwards of the circular motion. And you can think of this as your spatial component. And then your eye movements along the path of motion. And you can think of this as your timing component. For instance, after a head injury, what we often see is a lot of timing error. So our brains, in order to follow this target, are constantly predicting where this target's going to be so that we can follow it in real time. You know, otherwise, we can't react to things in real time. It takes about 150 milliseconds for our brain to process any new information. And we predict this information, then withhold our eyes so that we're sticking right to the target. I never get this one. After an injury, there's a lot more disinhibition. So you're still predicting where the target's going to be, but your eyes jump out into this forward predictive state, so where the target's going to be rather than where it is right now. I see. So it sounds like this is uh, starting to get some uh, real hard objective measures of, of this, whereas measures. maybe a subjective test that if you think about football, for example, a player really wants to get back in the game. They don't have a lot of incentive to say that I do have a concussion because they want to get back and continue the like game, but yet it may be detrimental to their health. So it sounds like this is a little bit of an objective intervention to be able to do a little bit more precise measurement as to what may actually oh, he's happen. Actually a better time. Yeah, absolutely. Under current protocols, you need a lot of cooperation from the players. They need to tell you about their symptoms, how they're feeling, their emotional state. There really isn't a whole mm -hmm. lot that you can do as objective measurement from the physician side. And this provides a quick piece of information that's entirely objective that they simply can't game. Can you talk a bit about how this project came about with the military? Sure. So soldiers started coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. That's cool. The military was saddled with this uh, enormous problem of head injury. One in five soldiers in combat receive a head injury. And that can linger and manifest itself in PTSD and other conditions. 
So they have a huge interest in solving this problem. So they supported a lot of the foundational research that went into this technology. I like this Large guy. clinical studies over several years. We're just finishing up one now of 10,000 individuals, 5,000 soldiers, 5,000 civilian athletes. And that's working its way into a continuation that's uh, with NCAA Pac-12, which will be looking at recovery rates for players that are injured. So the military has aggressively pursued this technology in addition to several others like blood biomarkers. And we see this as a commercialization of that effort. So the VR platform is really the ideally cost-effective way to bring this to athletics at all levels. Yeah, so maybe you could talk a bit about the timing here because we're talking about studying these different soldiers that are already back from warfare. And so and in the is use case of a sports good? game, someone could be struck really with a strong hit on the field and you see it and then you're able to do it right away. But how does this work? with a time delay of anywhere from a week, a Depends. month, or many months after the actual head trauma? Yeah, so ocular impairment manifests itself very quickly after an injury. So it's something that you can test very soon after in at least 90% of cases. It's very sensitive, so it's easily disrupted if it happens to be a neural network that stretches from your parietal lobe down to your cerebellum for coordination, mediated by the thalamus and then executed by your prefrontal cortex. And that prefrontal cortex in particular is highly exposed. It's at the front of your brain, furthest from your neck, and most vulnerable to whiplash. So it's a signal that can be detected very soon after, and it's quite sensitive to this injury. Like this and it can show improvement during your recovery as well. So you can see this impairment recover over time as you work your way back to your normal performance. So in this recovery process, are you giving other treatments from the doctor, they're doing these different exercises and then they're kind of just measuring how they're doing with their recovery? That's right, so there are a number of injuries that can occur with a force to the head. Brain injury is one of them. You can also have uh, damage to your inner ear, vestibular issues, balance issues, <coughs> or damage to your neck and spine, which could be chronic headaches or other issues as well. So this is a way to differentiate injury after a force to the head and tailor the treatments to you know, what's really going on. You know, everyone who has a knee injury doesn't have an ACL tear, and we don't treat knee injuries like they're an ACL tear. So it's a way to narrow in on the correct treatment for that individual. So it sounds like the eyes are kind of telling the story here in a lot of ways of like being able to measure and track the eyes given the input, then you're able to kind of hone into what, which one of these injuries they may actually have. Yeah, it's an innate ability of ours that really hones in on the physiology I that's happening don't really in your brain. Know what I'm doing. I'm just trying what to are some of the symptoms of people that you know may have some of these traumas? Are they, do they even recognize that they have it? It's like they can't really necessarily self-diagnose? Or what are the things that they may actually experience? Yeah, I mean, it can be very easy to detect. And uh, this technology might not be necessary. Nausea, uh, vomiting. Uh, headache, extreme headache, migraine, Mages, tail, but it also designer, can be RPG, much more mild on the spectrum, in which case mechanics. very difficult to communicate, that seems extremely you, know, relevant you feel right off. Now. I'm going to do that one. I don't know what to call this. Or stone and knowledge. The Voices of VR Podcast. <clears throat> My name is Kent Bai, and welcome to the Voices of VR podcast. So just ahead of GDC this year, Oculus showed about a dozen games that were going to be released later in the year. And one of those games was called Mage's Tale, which just came out today, June 20th, 2017. And it's an action RPG dungeon crawler game where you're spell casting these different spells against the enemies and That's you're cool. able to explore these different dungeons and find secret potions and combine these ingredients to create new spells so i had a chance to talk to the lead designer of david rogers and he is like super passionate about these different gameplay mechanics and at the heart of it being <coughs> able to create these virtual worlds and experiences that are able to fulfill his fantasies from his childhood imagination so this interview with David happened at the Oculus event ahead of GDC this year in San Francisco, California on Sunday, February 26, 2017. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm David yeah, Rogers, right the lead in. designer for Mage's Tale at In Exile. So Mage's Tale is a VR action RPG set in the fantasy world of the Bard's Tale. 
you're an apprentice mage and your master's just been kidnapped. It's up to you to delve through dungeons, master the arcane arts, defeat enemies, and ultimately save your master. You use the Oculus Touch in order to sling spells, block attacks, and solve puzzles. You collect mystic ingredients <laughs> in order to craft literally hundreds of spell combinations, and you're delving through 10 dungeons in an over 10 hour long gaming experience, ultimately culminating oh, in a boss battle where you save your master, hopefully, <laughs> if you're any good. Wow, so it seems like you're combining a number of different things here I with like a sneeze. dungeon crawler, but also, you know, there's a lot of different other elements as well as action RPG. Maybe you could I like talk about all the different dimensions that you're taunts. trying to combine here in this experience. Sure, yeah. So In Exile has a really illustrious history of being an RPG company. We illustrious. put out Wasteland 2. We just finished a fig campaign for Wasteland 3. We're coming out with Torment Tides of Numenair in like two days, and we're currently working on The Bard's Tale. We love RPGs, and so we wanted to bring mm -hmm. the RPG to VR because it seems like such a natural fit like we mm -hmm. came up with the Bard's Tale series and we're trying to herald the return of dungeon crawls and you know it started on graph paper and then it moved to 2D with like the Bard's Tale and then 3D with games like Grimrock and now we're putting you in the dungeon and we feel it makes every element of it just so much more amplified monsters are just more intimidating all those emotions like claustrophobia like just get amplified when you're in the dungeon your spatial awareness goes through the roof so like thinking of a classic dungeon crawler you might turn to the left and see a brick and you just press brick and then like a wall opens now we can get you looking like in and around and under things solving puzzles in these really intimate ways using your hands and then combat is just super action oriented super fast but it all ties into those rpg elements so and when i say rpg elements you can level up you can get additional health, unlock new gloves, you can open new spell slots, you can gain <coughs> unlocks for your shields, and you can grow in all these cool ways. But the other way it's an RPG, and this is like one of our the real shield, pillars does that mean is that you hit it once and then you get as you find all these puzzles that we've just hidden all over the place. But and the you can miss time, them, be sure. Like we don't put stuff on the, the critical person? path. You it need to actually me. explore the dungeon to find all the crafting ingredients. And as you find them, you can take them back to your wizard's lab and you can craft spells. So you might have a fireball but you could craft it into something so much more powerful. And that's really how you gain in power in terms of like damage output and like crowd control and all these other utilities. I can take a fireball and I can make it a triple shotting fireball that rebounds off walls and doubles damage each time it bounces really, really, and really, seeks really, really, enemies really, really, really and is like rainbow colored and explodes with confetti I'm not whenever it hits him somebody. Kill me like that. The options are, are I'm not I gonna say limitless, I'm very but aware. hundreds, like literally hundreds. You can do guided ice him. javelins, you can Great. do polymorphing wind blasts, you can do mind shit. laying okay. lightning cool. bolts. I'm just like, gonna it's hit him. so what? much fun. I've been playing through it, just doing balance For testing, fuck's and I can't sake. get myself out of it. I'm, I've been really enjoying it. Yeah, I think one of the striking things about this experience was just the art as well as the aesthetics that you have here. And so maybe you could talk a bit about creating the environments that you're exploring here and some of the design intentions that you're having there. Yeah, so like something I said earlier is one of the things that I think is a hallmark of the dungeon crawl is this sort of claustrophobic, like dark, dank experience where everything is sort of falling apart around you. And we use that in combination with VR to like, are there little chunks of the wall missing and you can reach in and oh, find a health potion and hid there? Or are there parts of the dungeon you can literally destroy to open up new routes and new secrets that you couldn't find before? We have the player over the course of our 10 dungeons Just going through three different, man. we call them tile sets, but they're kind of I like dungeon styles. Doing. So we have the sewers of Scara Bray, which were very wet and they look amazing, like you said. You saw like the water dripping down the walls and like the waterfalls coming out of pipes. We have a lot of like play with like water levels and things like that. And then you go through like what we call the crypt set, where you're delving through these like ornate ancient crypts of like lost kings. And then lastly, we have this very like geek Esque, these yes, living dungeons of the Charn, which I'm are an ancient evil race, and they Mage's almost like tale, grew their dungeon to their RPG own needs. And we make the player and really participate in sort of their evil acts. Like to open a door, there's a squishy eyeball there, and you have to poke it in order to open the door. And there's a squish sound, and you sort of you have to be a party to their evil a little bit, and it really puts you in this uncomfortable spot. I'm also just losing horribly. It really immersive. And our art team is amazing. That's what As I like do. a mission statement, we said we want to make the best looking VR game we can possibly manage. And then mission Not two really is making it run properly. Considering well, and then we did. Like it, you saw game. there, it ran 90 frames per second and it was butter smooth. But that's always been a real pillar for us. It's much louder than my audience. We oh. want to make something that feels like a triple A quality VR title rather than going like hyper stylized in order to make sure we can hit our frame rate needs. 
Yeah, and so maybe you could Is that better? a little bit more about the mechanics that you felt like were satisfying to do in VR. That I got a chance to throw and block things. Okay. So you have this. Yay! Uh, okay, special. thank you. <laughs> this is my first time trying out the podcast like with the satisfying kind of with the game at the same time. So, so just talking on on spell casting. When we were looking at what spells we wanted to do, we basically Oh shit, I forgot that I had to do that. You feel powerful. Like when you were a 10-year-old kid playing in your backyard. Whatever. I'm just like, going to just I'm just going to hit things now. And so we started like if you're doing wind blast, you need to pose like that because of how we make the spell leave your hand and how you aim. I'm not going to win this game obviously. I've done very very poorly. Make sure you actually had to throw it like a javelin. If you throw it sideways or weird, it'll limply fall out of your hands. You need to align it properly and like get a good heft and really huck it. And then when it comes to we call them non-essential fun items, but they're absolutely essential. There's these little items that you They're good podcasts for Hearthstone. <laughs> you can pick them up and if you put them to your Cuz that would be really great right now. Horn of Gondor. I found which I never really expected. I think I could play a whole game just I can't kick his ass I lost. You know like the act of like drinking <laughs> you health potions and you put them to your I can try it again. I'm just trying to level all my characters level 10 cuz I was told this what I should do. Like, but I'm not good. We have these so, mushrooms you can eat that do exactly what you think ugh. they do. And you actually have to like put them in your mouth. And that was something I never really expected, but as soon as I Take his ass, bass. I like that, that was, like I just <coughs> it wherever I could. There's also some really nice interactions. You can pick objects up and throw them and that's sort of like something everyone's familiar with, but we've also played around with just how objects interact with your hands as you as you just waft them through the world. So there's like objects on ropes, and you just you don't have to grab them, but your hand being there will just push them to the side, and they sway gently. Or in the mage's lab, we have lazy Susans that you just sort of pass your hand by. The angry chicken. Just, it's a podcast. It's very gratifying, and you find people just like getting them going really. These are like all too big. Like I don't know what to do with it's them. A toy within a toy. Yeah, and it seems like you know there's a. Let me see if I can find uh, the angry mostly chicken. Mostly around you know finding an object and then putting into the right spot. But as you're thinking about this as a 10 hour experience, I'm curious to hear. There's that one, one chicken with a plus five rage all the while keeping you up to date on everything going on in Hearthstone. That's great. Okay, let's try the Hearthstone podcast. I have no idea if it's any good. Let me also play my turn. There we go. The angry chicken. Much to do about Druid. Let's see if there's one that's a little, that's like relevant to me. I've been doing that. Wow, these podcasts are like, got like 200, over 200 podcasts. Oopsies. Oh, okay. Let me see. I'm trying to find a good podcast now. I wish I could just like see a better stream of it. But it's like on a website. It's not very good. These look like YouTube videos too. I don't really. I'll just kind of pick one that looks good coming up. Is Angry Chicken a card? And I just don't know about this card yet. <laughs> Use this thing. Not exactly the best way to play it. Might as well use this thing. Okay, then I'm not alone at least. <laughs> oh, but if you want to help me, I'm trying to get to 100 followers because I made a bet that if I get to 100 followers, I get to have a pet rat. And I really want to have a little pet ratty friend helping me play Hearthstone. So follow me. And then I get a pet rat. And that can be as soon as possible. Because I want the little cutie ratty friend. This is like... 
This is not good for me. Thank you! Pat Rat is so cool, and I'm gonna sit, her on, sit him or her on my shoulder, and they're gonna cuddle me. It's gonna be cute! Hmm. It's saying these are... I don't know if these are podcasts, or if these are, like... videos. <clears throat> yeah, I'm doing well right now. Damn it! I suck at this. Good lord. Oh, those are live shows. I just don't follow unless someone has a complete bio schedule, so I know they'll stream regularly, but you seem fun. Huh, thank you. I'm working on my schedule um, and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I just made mine, but I'm legit doing this, so also let me know when's a good time, you think, to be streaming. I like around lunch. It's good. A good Hearthstone game for lunch. Hopefully I'll get better once I have some cards. I also don't have great cards. I've noticed this. <sighs> Let's just see how this drew this, the newest podcast of the Angry Chicken is. That will just kill me. Put him down. <sighs> yeah, that's why I'm trying to level them all up to 10 to at least get like the basic pack cards for all of them. <sighs> I've had people tell me the Hearthstone is expensive, but it's only expensive because people really, really want to buy all of the cards. <laughs> Hmm. No, it's not gonna hurt him. Ugh, I'm taking a risk here. Okay, whatever. I do have people that are really good that help me play. That's life, isn't it, though? Just constantly, constantly lose until you eventually level up. Oh, this guy's gonna kill me. I'm gonna die. Well, I really had to just, I had no other option to put this guy down. <laughs> Can I do damage to anyone? Still too damaged to him directly then. I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> That's my quote. <laughs> That's my new official quote. <laughs> That's life, no, just constantly, constantly lose until you eventually level up. That's sad. <laughs> well, you know what? 
That's how my dad plays the games. He just, what's it called when you play the game over and over and over again and you're just like finding resources and like leveling up. There's grinding. like grinding. He just grinds. That's how he, you know, he, he was grinding for uh, No Man's Sky and he got everything on a planet before he even left the planet. I don't know why he's not live streaming. He should be live streaming. He's really good. And he's got an interesting British personality to go along with it. Oh, the mystery voice is Jason. You're, you're not visible. He's my co-founder, also streamer. You can follow him too. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have anything though. <laughs> You can follow Liminal and that will show you a bunch of different people live streaming. We're going to be live streaming like VR, AR, um, different games. Hearthstone just like a first test run, I think, really. We're going to have a lot more interesting content coming up. And I'm pretty sure my dad is watching now. So dad, get your live stream shit together. Jason seems like a badass. Oh, look at his face. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to be in the stream. His voice isn't that deep. <laughs> I think you should be in my stream. You can play your game while I'm we'll be in your stream later. doing mine. We'll okay. do the hologram stream together. Okay, we're going to be doing a streaming for building 3D objects in Hologram, which is a new program um, for building 3D objects that we can then import into virtual reality. So he'll be in that one. So if you want to see Jason, he'll be in that one soon. I'm probably just going to finish this game and then probably start that. Or have lunch first, yeah. No, I'm not hungry. <laughs> He could probably tear a man's heart out with his bare hands. How do you know I haven't done that before? <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> Say it again. I think they heard it. I don't know how good this mic is. Yeah, let's wait for a second and listen to it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I totally heard myself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm just gonna kill him, and I'm gonna kill him, and then I'm gonna just end my turn. Jason would threaten to tear a man's heart out with his poor <laughs> hands. Would he do it? Probably not. His hands are pretty soft. You said you liked your soft hands. No, I agree. Completely agree. <laughs> gotta keep them soft. Really important. My hands are probably tougher than his hands. What's true? I have fuck all. Well, that's cute. I like soft man hands, no homo. That's fine if you're gay. But if you're not, that's also fine. <laughs> In this gamer world, I hear people use gay a lot. It's like a derogatory thing. I think it's a fantastic compliment. I would honestly love to just be called gay all the time. No one ever thinks I am, so... Destroy all minions. Or I can charge, or I can deal three damage to all characters. <clears throat> and I don't want to waste it on dealing three damage to all my characters, like all the characters now. Or to just charge and hurt one of them. You'll just charge at him directly.
Who is Deathstroke HD? I'm not gonna win, but sure, I guess so. Why not? <laughs> you like watching a... You if you like playing against someone who you know you're gonna win against, then yeah, sure. I'm fine with playing. That's, that'll be fun. For somebody. Not me. I want to deal damage to all my characters. I'm just going to hit him. Not a valid target. Well, screw that. I don't want to do that. Deal two damage. Shia LaBeouf could dig a hole straight to my heart. Oh, that's really cute! <laughs> Here, you can find me. I'm RGBubs1224. That's me, if you find me. I'm going to guess that you're the same username? I don't know. Let me know. Well, that was a great curve. Hmm. <laughs> I shouldn't do like five out of my six. Uh... <clears throat> I am totally down for playing against pretty much everybody. It doesn't mean that I'm going to win. Maybe I'll get better. Maybe I'll just be sad and miserable. We'll see. He has seven characters on the board right now. Mm -hmm. This might be a time to play my kill all the characters one. Oh no, now he's got five. Well, is this three damage to all characters? Yeah, I might just have to murder them. I'm gonna do that. Oh wait, I had him first. Hit. Murder. Oh, that's my battle tag. RG Bubs, one, two, two, four. Ah, uh, ba 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 ba. Should I charge him or just restore to health to myself? Cause like, damage, charge, damage, charge. Charge him. Alrighty. <sighs> If you're on the North American server, apparently if you're on the European server, I can't play against you. But if you're on the North American server, I can play against you. So, that's a thing. So if you try to send me a request or something like that, and you're on the European, I apparently won't get it, which we've discovered. What is that? Oh. Dude. I need to die less. Destroy all minions. Well, I don't really want to fucking do that now, do I? Your other minions have one one. I like that. Except for that my I don't have other minions that are really that important or significant in any way, shape, or form at this point. Um. Ugh. I'll put him down just because I'm kind of like. There we go. Hey! Ah! Stink. <laughs> well, that might be nice to play.
Oh, I should have played that and then that. Poop. I'm just gonna hit him directly. Cause like that's a thing. Put him down. I could have put my monkey down. Should have put my damn monkey down. Should have put the damn monkey down. <laughs> Oh, I never played the Angry Chicken. The Angry Chicken is a production of AMove TV. Bookmark AMove.tv for more gaming and esports shows. Okay. The Angry Chicken is directly supported by listeners like you via patreon.com slash TAC. I have a Patreon too. If you want me to get decent cards, you can you can be a patron. <laughs> I'm sure people know about the angry chicken. I have no idea. You knew about it. <clears throat> Mysterious Jason. A podcast about Hearthstone, Heroes of Warcraft. This is the Angry Chicken. This is the Angry Chicken. Greetings and welcome back, everyone. This is indeed the Angry Chicken. I'm Garrett Weinzerl, and I am joined, as always, by Jocelyn Moffin. How are you doing, Jocelyn? As always. Oh, you might be muted. Totally forgot to unmute my mic. <laughs> All right. But I'm amazing. Yeah. Except for the total terrible internet issues, but basically fine. For 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 those unaware, uh, Jocelyn and I have already recorded one full podcast today, and that that brief moment of silence uh, pretty much is a perfect representation. Oh, okay. So they have how smoothly today's recording a video been. podcast. Yeah, I think it took us Got it. like two hours to record like one hour of audio. <laughs> yeah, more or less, more or less. So, oh no, he put lots of things down. Listens to embrace the spoilers this week. Oh, but I'm going to kill him. There were seven cuts while we tried to make that damn thing. But, uh, anyways, as uh, some of you may know, and it might be a surprise to others who don't listen to the ends of uh, podcast, which is everyone on Earth, which means no one knows. Adils is traveling, so he is not here today. But in his stead. Someone was, was worse than me. Extraordinaire Raven. Someone was worse than me. Raven. Welcome That's great. Raven. <laughs> Thank you. Play. It's awesome to be on here. I, will, I catch it as often as I can. As I have to see. Time. I can't see your friend request. Hold on a second. Line up that well with me, but it's, uh, it's good to be here. Looking forward to it. We're excited about having you on. So you're. I don't you're see a friend uh, request. Also, in, in addition to being a human, uh, our next goal on our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the patron goal is my main form. And then the humans just some I do on the side, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah that you, happen, Are you in on North America yeah, servers? It's, it's like your final form. You're gonna get like your hair's gonna turn golden or something. <gasps> That'd be so cool. Does it show something? <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Or or, what does this or mean? possibly blue. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're a, a current Dragon Ball fan. Um, anywho, uh, yeah. How's how's Hearthstone? I don't have any friend requests around the table, Raven. Since you're our guest. Uh, I'll start with you. What's what's Hearthstone been like for you in the last week, or since this is your first time on ever? How's it been since Frozen Throne has launched? Uh, yeah, so um, since Frozen Throne has launched, I've played a lot. I actually uh, I, I stream pretty much every day at home, uh, which isn't much this year, which is a good thing, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I played like I think I played for the first five days, then stopped and realized I played over five hundred games easily. I was like, okay, that's quite a lot of Hearthstone. Um, you have like yeah, 500 really games? Like, yeah, the Death Knights. I think what they did with that and putting them in was great versus... I play like um, 10 uh, games and I'm like, I am emotionally drained. Issues. Uh, I think Mostly because I'm just losing, subject, so that's probably that's why maybe he wins. Uh, but other than that, I think the expansion's <laughs> awesome. It's been a lot of fun streaming it. it I can't play any well, of these motherfuckers. Two to three weeks then I've actually been at home before I go traveling off again tomorrow. Give me some ones. So, one. Awesome. One one. Well, that's uh, that's fantastic, and I, I I'm pretty sure uh, both Josh and I are sitting here being jealous of your <coughs> games calm because I don't know about you, Josh, but I've just been sitting here watching. I'm in coffee, which is really great for streaming. Fighting uh, Lich King with a million hit points and just uh, just wishing I was over there. 
Don't complain, Garrett. At least you can watch it. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, that's, what, oh, that's, that's my battle point. tag. Yep, that's right. That's, that's right. That's a good point. <laughs> I, never, I never thought I would be getting high-roaded by Jocelyn by mentioning I have functioning internet. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I imagine Gamescom announcements so far have been amazing. Yeah, they've been, I haven't they've seen been them, but solid. everyone seems excited. Uh, well, in short, uh, uh, Fireside Brawls are coming, and uh, we're getting Kel'Thuzad in Heroes huh. of the Storm, and we're finally getting a new Overwatch short Itchy. for the first time since BlizzCon of last year. Nice. So, you get your headphones. Uh, there's, there's your catch-up, Jocelyn. I'm glad I could help yeah. you. I'm not bad. <laughs> Game's coming in a nutshell. But yes, I am very jealous, Raven, that you get to go. I think um, it's one What's con that I have never been Nothing. to. Nothing. He's just kind of a weird so purple. freaking big, and they always I don't know why I don't see her quest stuff. either. They're What's your like, tag? BlizzCon not held by, like, not actually hosted by Blizzard. So I, I just Space Jam? Man. I wish I could go, but yeah, the, the yeah. whole... Europe yeah, traveling thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me with everywhere else traveling thing. Yeah. Most hearts on events. You got a copy of Space Jam? Uh, but, but yeah, like, uh, I've never been to Gamescom before, so this will be my first time uh, doing the HD I don't have a copy of Space Jam, Jam, but I feel like maybe my partner Sean would invite me. At last. At last. But I don't know your battle tag. It's an hour away on a plane, and I've not been yet. It's crazy. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it does. In, in this uh, case, I, I just gonna kind of kill him. Up their presence, it, it really does look like a miniature BlizzCon, uh, just kind of landed in the middle of Gamescom. Uh, but yeah, uh, past week for me in Hearthstone, I uh, I stopped by. Let uh, me try this. Our local Florida Fireside, and by local I mean it's still a two-hour drive for me. <laughs> but I went <laughs> and did it, um, and this is our first Florida Fireside since our uh, innkeeper Amy was hired by Blizzard. That's not how that works. Away by I have to do it. Where do I do it? Game developers that make games that I can't stop playing or talking about. Oh, well, you're just coming, dude. Um, Andy, who has uh, taken over him and his crew, my goodness, guys, they have play my the turn. sickest venue at a uh, local college in Orlando. It's uh, called Full Sail. If you're unfamiliar with it, it's a kind of a big like art, music, kind of tech uh, college and they have they, they found a venue there that's like this awesome lounge it almost looks like a bar but it's not a bar has they and <laughs> because it's a it's a tech school Does that work copious copious wi-fi so i just walk nice. in here I'm there's okay. like 80 people let me know if you got that four top tables in there the lighting is awesome they've got hearthstone music playing they've got a wall that's being projected on it's so freaking great and uh, i hear tale from andy that uh they're planning to to do these uh they're trying to ramp up to monthly uh do some more tavern hero mm -hmm. stuff so if you are in the central florida area and haven't been to one of the florida firesides or even if you have been before but you haven't been in a while you, you owe it to yourself to stop by one of these uh, i'm really impressed with the uh with the venue that they found here i'm jealous i uh sometimes sometime you saw the request then though what's, what's up um, and now, because I'm never here, there, there are none really that happen, and I also can't go to any. So yeah. I'm, I'm very. No, you do friend uh, requests, except it's side. not like working. The friend request part isn't working. Fun. Yeah, it's it's good. My only issue is I'm huh? tired by the time I get there. In the long, uh, <laughs> well, that's what I thought, but like. I was. I mean, that gets that gets you halfway. So our problem before was a, to the bottom. Someone else was trying to find me, and it, but they were or spectate me, but they were on a different server. So maybe you're just on a different server, which is, this is ridiculous. Most of the bands in the U.S. don't bother. So disappointing. Where I live, because it's not worth it. But uh, but yeah, it's, it was a good time. And if anyone's interested, uh, go to meetup.com/floridafireside to uh, to check it out and find out when the next event is. <gasps> you live in France. Now, That's in why you live in France. Place. You're on the European yeah, server, so I can't play with you. Is, uh, is, is, uh, I feel like there's got to be a work up around that, a work around with that. Almost single. We'll have to look that up and see, because that sucks. <laughs> So and they're still sponsoring the show. If you're unfamiliar with HelloFresh, they are the meal kit delivery service uh, that brings fresh uh, food, ready-to-cook meals straight <coughs> to the door with everything you could possibly need to complete the recipes that they have curated for you. Uh, and uh, I love this. Plus, they have a nice code for you all to use. Move! Dollars off of your first week of deliveries. What? So HelloFresh.com and enter the code TAC30. That is T-A-C-30. No, where in France are you? That's awesome. I just went to Paris for the first time. The worst grocery shopper in the world. And I played a lot of video games. <clears throat> this last, this is last December. Service. It beats the pants off. I did it in the winter, though, so it wasn't exactly like... 
Did they deliver to the me? best time to potentially have gone, but I did see um, in Paris, like the whole setup they had for Christmas down the big street that I can't remember the name of, that I feel like I should know the name of, but I don't know the name of. It's not really the healthiest lifestyle. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing, a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a, a headline here that says HelloFresh ranked the fastest growing company in Europe. I'm 99% sure HelloFresh is actually a UK company that just expanded to the States. So I think it actually started okay. with you, Raymond. Okay. Well, there you go. I mean, we make all the best stuff, okay? Yep. You know, HelloFresh, Hearthstone Casters, mm. I mean, the list goes on at this point. <laughs> Well, I'll see if I can go. find something about the server issue. With people across up. servers, Hearthstone. <laughs> Stinks. Well, already then. Uh, we thank them for the support again. HelloFresh.com. Use the code TAC30 when you sign up. Now. Mm, I don't like this whole losing thing. Losing, 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 losing. Good news, everyone. Oh my god, what a great noise effect they have in that. So there's a lot of jury talk today, and they're uh, just basically in person. Why is everything show, whether you're on the Reddit, the green Sunday, and forums, so on and so on. There's going to be a lot of jury talk on this show, so we figured we'd kick it off with uh, Mr. XR, a.k.a. Dean, uh, being rather rather chatty on the subject of Druid, which has really taken over the Reddit as of late. Um, we're not going to mention everything verbatim, but uh, getting into it, uh, really what it seems spurred his response was the Are being uh, Facebook the friends issue work? Druid is surpassing I don't think it works because of Facebook friends. Of Undertaker Hunter. No, that wouldn't do it. Really, uh, have perfect stats to make that kind of claim. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was but you can find my Facebook page. Vicious Syndicate. <laughs> they posted their latest like meta numbers basically and said that the popularity of Druid is now more than the I need to do something. Of published stats for I'm just going to do this. But the problem is that Vicious Syndicate is measuring like then... a very, very small amount of time and a very, very small amount of data, whereas Blizzard that... is measuring then... the popularity of Undertaker this... over, I think, okay, let me see how like that five goes. or six weeks. I'm looking up and popularity. seeing... So, I mean, they're they're basically comparing apples to oranges. This is indeed intended, and nothing is broken or be fixed, yeah, although very, very .NET is split into two separate regions, therefore Hearthstone has two separate regions, which means everything about your account, collection, and friends is separate. This isn't technically a design choice, just side effect of maintaining separate servers due to region differences and most likely related to performance. It's not impossible to maintain separate regions but still make the game act as one server, but this is the technological hurdle that most likely isn't feasible due to any reasons Blizzard may have. One day Who? less than a week we had of the expansion. I don't like that. Like that. Week and a half. So, you know, those numbers, you, you gotta really like look at them properly and try and understand them, but the more uh, the more verbal people in the community are not really too great with numbers, unfortunately, and don't really uh, and don't really understand them, right? It's, uh, I don't know. It's kinda of funny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I can understand it where and there's already comments in our in our chat happening right now saying he's got stealth a, you know, on right now and, uh, and and also with damaged by damage kind of training minion damaged by this oh that's fun stats, if your of, opponent's turn someone as to, like to, to go oh, oh. don't have perfect stats why are you making these thanks follow me i get a pet ratty if i get 100 follows to do so thank you this type of thing is going to keep happening over and over again Every time a new deck surges in popularity. Yeah, I think. Well, then... Sorry, Raven. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think one of the problems is it's the same with announce uh, expansion uh, dates, uh, nerf dates, or, or nerfs in general. Is that whenever Blizzard or your know, Team Five or whoever you want to aim at, like say, you know, oh, this is going to happen, or this is a number, this is a number. The same thing still kind of happens. Like people run oh, away no. from these numbers, make grand assumptions yeah. on them, and and still ah. make up stories basically. And it's not that there's nothing behind this this well, druid or, or, or the druid numbers in general. But I feel like at least he died. kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't to a certain extent when it comes to releasing okay. you know, numbers. I would really wish he, I wish he would have killed all my characters because then. <laughs> it's very true because I mean, just the Undertaker Hunter number already. They released that number. It's official. Blizzard Whoa, stats. It's God, oh. in the ass. Yep. 
<laughs> okay, so I can play that's him. That's all very good points. Oh, <laughs> shit, Coop. Where, where, Raven, where do you well, I'm, he's not going to die, at least. I tend to on the side, especially I'm right going to kill him, probably. Early. Deal three damage to all my characters. All those characters are short. Two health to a friendly character. This all shakes out. And then I can yeah, put down I my golem. Post is, it's very good. I might just do the that. actually talked about is very interesting, and to me, sounds more like the issue. Everyone's like, oh, infestation is the problem. Oh, I didn't realize he was going to get, it, like, everything. Like, it, if, a, <laughs> um, if a druid couldn't ramp... Just kidding. Well, that was... So, that backfired actually, tremendously. ...should do silly things. <laughs> uh, that's why, you know, it's a reward for getting to the late This game. happens to yeah, me a lot. We, we, let's be honest, a fairly aggressive card game, you know. The aggro decks are always dominant no matter what's going on. Curve builds are always dominant, which a lot of curves don't often plan to get to 10 most of the time in general. But... I think the issues are when you combine all these. He's so close to dying, and he's gonna. Ramp, uh, Holy fuck! And then I think you hit the nail on the head with the. Uh, oh my god! I was doing like okay. Is actually kind of insane. And, and like, now I'm just, just fucked. Mirrors, then now I am just a hundred percent fucked. I have fifteen. One, two, three. Just a, it's, eight, it's a card, nine, ten. Isn't even a tech card, oh, fucking like, shit! It's, it's nuts. Right, and that's, well, and I can't do anything uh, except, like, sorry, that's where he mostly hope to God that I get something that's helpful. No. Okay. He won. I think I'm going to end it here. Probably short up that I want to play hol or play around with hologram, uh, yeah, build some 3D that. objects. If you remove that card from so once he murders me in whatever kind way, I mean, Drew has a bit of a rough time versus Murder. Well played. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Be a little bit tough with Pirate Warrior. I was playing Druid just before the show, and I <laughs> nailed the same. What is he doing? Uh, uh, the, the same I sometimes I wish they would just like Both kindly I, kill me. Because me, you know, when it's like this, that's just not even funny. <laughs> it's not fair. Like, the attack doesn't matter. It's the fact that they just burn damage on those taunts. All Why? Why are you wasting your time uh, killing my guy? Time to get you more high powered cards later on. And I think it's three, insane. And ultimate three. infestation. I think it's fine. But it's just all the ramp. Innovate is the nightmare card for me. It should just restore crystals. I'm assuming he's going to put down something that will kill me. Just restore crystals you already have. Uh, I think that's the worst one. The what? Because you really cheat with that card. Uh, but yeah, everything combined is is what's making Druid popular. And why didn't he just kill me? At most ranks. At he just like is making my life harder. <laughs> I can't do anything to stop him. I can deal four damage to a minion, and I can charge and hit him, but that's it. I can't do anything else, so I'm just gonna hurt myself. See what I get. Okay. Pretty straightforward plan most of the time. That's all I got. That means just like Undertaker Hunter, like it's it's a pretty straightforward deck, so more people will gravitate to it. And and again, that changes. Yeah. Why not? Numbers of the percentage. Okay. Now kill me. So if you had, it sounds like you're leaning towards Innervate. If you had to choose between Innervate and Oh, uh, 100% I would nerf Innervate. Okay. If, if you Thank you. Good Christ. Even all the ramp, the, the tempo. I think he just wanted to ramp, play his cards. <laughs> no one often ramps okay. 10. Okay, cool. I'm at 8, so I've almost gotten him leveled up to 10. I think I have... Innovate, let me see how many more I have to go. Destroy a demon, innovate restore innovate 5 health uh, to your hero. Oh, that that's card. awesome. Who's demons? Like, all just made it restore crystals, kind of which is better. Um, then it would solve a lot of problems, and it would also solve a different problem that I also hate, which is innovate pink bird. Okay, so <laughs> I need to finish the rogue, paladin, druid, warrior, shaman, and I'm almost done with the warlock. But I think that's it for. My Hearth Hearthstone stream. Thanks for watching. Follow me, and I get pet ratties, and then the stream gets at least cuter. Bye.